Hello everybody, welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 7 unit of the Head and Neck. This is our very first lecture on the osteology. So before we get started on this very large unit called the Head and Neck, we're going to very briefly talk about it. So for many students and many teachers, they often talk about how this is the most difficult portion of anatomy, it's the most feared one, everyone should kind of just kind of shudder and hide when this unit comes around. And I think that's kind of silly. I think Head and Neck is probably the best unit of anatomy, but also it's a very complicated one, but that doesn't mean it's a difficult one. I think if you kind of walk through the head and neck, and you walk through it with a purpose, this becomes a very, very fun chapter. And I think it's the best portion of all of anatomy and actually all of medicine. I think the head and neck is the most beautiful portion of anatomy, just because it's very interesting, it's very fascinating. And it's also very beautiful from a literal aspect because it provides most of the aesthetic component of the face. So when we talk about the bones of the face, and the bones of the skull, the bones of the head and neck, you have things called the irregular and flat shaped bones. So the irregular shaped bones are what you would consider to be the facial bones, so these right here. Then you have the irregular shaped bones, which are the ones that more or less compose the skull cap, or the structures that kind of keep the central nervous system protected. So as I mentioned before, the skull, the face, is very important from that aesthetic beauty aspect. But it's also important because it provides a very durable protection to the central nervous system and protects the brain from trauma. It's actually also very important to know that the skull is actually divided into three interior regions called the anterior, middle, and the posterior cranial fossa, and we'll describe what their borders are in a little bit. But these specific regions of the skull actually help you identify different central nervous structures within the skull itself. So the bones of the head and the face are very unique because they have very defining contours. And these contours are unique to every, anywhere else in the whole body. They pretty much have their own purpose based on what their own structure and shape is. They also contain very small, tiny little channels or tunnels called framina. This is important because it's the passageway of very important neurovascular structures. And it's also important to know that there are 14 facial bones. And it's very important to know them all. And we'll discuss what those 14 bones are. But again, just to keep you prepared, there are 14 bones of the face itself. The head and neck also has a structure called the calvarium, as we mentioned before, which is also called the skull cap. And this is what kind of protects the central nervous system superior, laterally, and posteriorly. And it is formed by intramembranous ossification, as we'll describe in a little bit. The bones that make up the calvarium include the frontal bone. And this is actually composed of two different unique bones fused anteriorly right here. And it actually helps form the anterior portion, and significant portion of the anterior cranial fossa. Then you have the occipital bone, which houses the occipital lobe of the brain and forms posterior cranial fossa. Then you have the parietal bone, which is a superior lateral portion of the skull right here and right here. And it's pretty easy to memorize. This is the region where men kind of start to bald. This is the parietal region. Then you have a structure called the base of the cranium. And the base of the cranium is kind of what we talked about with that anterior, that middle, and that posterior cranial fossa. And that's kind of where the base of the skull kind of meets these vertebral column and other soft tissue structures. And it's important because this is where a lot of actual loading actually occurs. This is where a lot of angulation and rotation actually happens with the skull is moving laterally up, down, and trying to angulate but on a fixed point. And this base of the cranium is important because it has to be strong. It has to be durable. And for any reason, if you have a, a, a cranial base of cranial fracture, you're at significant risk for a lot of sequelae, including herniations, increased intracranial pressures, significant bleeds, and it's just very, very bad. So the bones of the base of the cranium are composed of things like the ethmoid, the sphenoid, the temporal, which we'll discuss shortly, as well as that frontal and that occipital that we just mentioned. So first we're going to go ahead and discuss what is this ethmoid bone. And it's probably one of my favorite bones in the whole, whole skull, whole face, is because it has very different but very purposeful functions. One of them being that it separates the nasal cavity from the brain. Another one is it forms a significant portion of the orbital wall. And this, this nasal cavity separation from the brain is actually happens by a region called the cribriform plate. This cribriform plate kind of looks like this, where it's this plate, right? When you're looking down, if we're looking at a bird's eye view on the bottom of the anterior uh, cranial fossa. We're well, looking down right here. It has all these little holes. And these little holes are actually where you actually have the olfactory nerve projecting its fibers through. And the last one is you have the perpendicular plate. This perpendicular plate is this right here. This perpendicular plate is actually what forms one of the very significant portions of the bony nasal septum, along with this structure right here called the vomer. 
Then you have the sphenoid bone. So the sphenoid bone is a very unique structure. It looks like Batman wings or butterfly wings. It's a large shaped bone that's fixed between the temporal and the occipital bones, very much interior in the skull. And if you were just to take a skull and actually try to look at it from the outside in, it's very difficult to actually visualize where and what the sphenoid bone is because it's a very irregularly shaped bone. But it's a very purposeful bone. It contains very significant functions such as muscles, and mastication attachment sites, it's significant border for the cranial fossa, it has numerous uh, neurovascular framing, especially for things like the trigeminal nerve, and it contains four very primary structures. One of them being the sphenoid body, this is where the cell turcica resides. This is where, right around here, where the pituitary gland actually sits down in this area. The next portion is the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Now, this is a wall for the pterygoid canal. It's a, it forms a portion of the superior orbital fissure, actually also a portion of the orbit. It contains the foramen rotundum, which is where, which nerve passes through? The maxillary nerve. And the foramen ovale, which is what passes through? The mandibular nerve. And the foramen spinosa, which is what where it passes through? The middle meningeal artery. Very good. Then you have the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And this forms a wall for the superior orbital fissure. And then lastly, you have these pterygoid plates. So these pterygoid plates are actually composed of two components. One is the medial pterygoid plate, which contains the pterygoid hamulus. The pterygoid hamulus is located right about here. And this is where you actually have a wrapping around of the tensor valley palatini, which is a muscle we'll discuss in the oropharynx chapter, that helps with tensing the station tube and allowing for opening of the station tube for drainage. Then the last one is you have the lateral pterygoid plate. The lateral pterygoid plate is where the attachment of the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles of mastication are. And this is important because many people get confused with this. They think they hear the words medial and lateral pterygoid and they think they attach to the medial and lateral pterygoid respectively and that's not true. The medial and lateral pterygoid muscles attach to the lateral pterygoid plate. But it's the medial aspect and the lateral aspect of the lateral pterygoid plate in which these muscles attach to. And that's pretty much about it. So now the temporal bone. So the temporal bone is a very unique bone. It's a very important bone that's located kind of in the inferior portion of the skull. And it's located right next to the parietal bones, the sphenoid bones, as well as, or as closely in proximity to the zygomatic arch and the mandible as well. It contains four primary regions, the petrous region, the squamous region, the mastoid region, and the tympanic region. It also contains very specific processes as well. The zygomatic process, which attaches to the zygomatic bones to help with the zygomatic arches, and provides that elevation, that projection, which allows the infratemporal fossa to reside underneath. It also contains the mastoid process, which is often a place where you have hollowing out and mastoiditis, commonly caused by infectious bugs like H. influenza, and can cause significant long-term sequelae, hearing complications. You have the styloid process, which is a thin, bony, projected structure that is important for the attachment of muscles like the stylopharyngeus and helps with actual attachment of other ligamentous structures to help with the mandible's functions. You have the internal auditory canal, which is difficult to actually visualize because you can't actually see from here, but it's an actually a canal that will lead to the internal auditory space that allows for the projection of, of structures like the facial and the vestibular cochlear nerves. And then you have your external auditory meatus, which is the structure right here, and this is where actually air can conduct into the tympanic membrane to actually aid in sound production. And it's also important to note that the internal auditory canal and the external auditory canal do not actually share a communication. They are actually two independent structures. So I'm going to discuss the visocranium. This is those bones of the skull that don't actually protect the brain. These are those more regularly shaped bones that kind of confer that aesthetic unique human based structure to the skull. It's defined by having 14 bones. You have two mandibles. You have two maxillas which are fused right here in the middle. You have one mandible. You have two zygomatic bones. You have palatine bones that are kind of hard to visualize from here. You have two nasal bones. You have one vomer right in the middle that provides a portion of that bony nasal septum. You have two inferior nasal concha and then you have two lacrimal bones that form a medial portion of the orbit. So now we're going to discuss these sutures as we kind of briefly discussed before. These are these immobile fibrous joints that are fused together to provide that very strong durable protection for the skull and the face. At birth, these sutures actually aren't fused. They're actually very movable. And in a neonatal examination, 
you can actually elevate and depress different portions of, of opposing bones across these suture lines to actually see if these sutures are actually fused or not. And it's important because you don't you need these sutures to be open. You need these sutures to not fuse in order to allow for proper brain growth. So there are many different types of sutures. Pretty much anywhere two bones meet and are fused in the face, they form a suture. And oftentimes they're named sutures. So we're not going to go through all the different sutures throughout the whole skull. We're just going to go over the ones that are most important to know. You have the fusion between the frontal bones, called the metopic suture. You have a fusion between the frontal and parietal bones, called the coronal suture. This is where you can imagine a crown actually sitting on. You have a fusion between the parietal bones, called the sagittal suture. Then you have the fusion of the parietal and occipital bones, called the lambdoid suture. So, based on the fact that these sutures don't fuse at birth, you can have areas called fontanelles. These are very soft tissue structures in which you actually can kind of feel into the underlying central nervous brain. And you have an anterior and a posterior fontanelle. So your anterior fontanelle is located here. It's also called the bregma. It's very large. And it's actually, when you feel it, is triangular in shape. And this triangular shaped fontanelle is actually the one that closes a little bit later. And you can actually feel it very easily in a neonatal examination. It's the junction between the frontal and parietal bones, and it's at the intersection of the metopic, the coronal, and the sagittal sutures. Then you have the posterior fontanelle. This is triangular in shape. You can sometimes even feel this one too on a neonatal examination, but it's usually a little bit hard, harder sometimes. This is a fusion between the lambdoid sutures right here and the sagittal suture itself. And it's a junction between the parietal and the occipital bones, parietal and occipital here. So as we discussed before, the skull growth. The skull growth is important because it's defined by two different types of ossification, intramembranous and endochondral. The intramembranous ossification does not use achondrocytes, does not use cartilage as an intermediate. That's pretty much it. And this is composed of things like the flat bones, the frontal, the parietal bones we discussed before. The ones that do use cartilage as an intermediate are the endochondral, hence chondro for chondrocytes. These are the ones that do use cartilage as an intermediate in ossification. These are the ones that are the irregular shaped bones, like the 14, 14 bones of the face, even the occipital, my favorite, the ethmoid bone, and the sphenoid bones. And what's important to know is that the skull grows perpendicularly to the brain growth. So, if the brain is growing up, you're going to expect the skull to grow perpendicularly. Easy enough. And what happens when the skull is fused prematurely, then you're not going to get this perpendicular growth. You're actually going to get parallel growth. And besides the fact that the brain is going to grow throughout infancy and early childhood, it's also important to know that the sutures aren't fused because it actually even helps with delivering the birth of the, of the fetus of the baby through the vaginal canal. So when we talk about the skull, when we talk about the face, it's also important to talk about the sinuses. So people often think and they often know what the sinuses are. There's these hollow cavities located deep within the skull that often get infected and serve no other purpose. Which is true, they do get infected quite often and people often get frustrated by them. But what's important is that these sinuses actually are not formed at birth. These are developmentally created. It's not until like the six, seven, eighth years old when these cavities start to finally reach their almost their adult shaped sizes and actually their adult shaped functions. And it's the sinuses that actually help with the resonance, it helps with with this sound production that kind of creates the unique voice for people. So as you can imagine, when kids and little, little babies and infants don't have these sinuses, their voices don't really sound like an adult because it doesn't have the ability for sound to kind of resonate and bounce around these structures. And once these children start to develop these sinuses, their voice starts to change a little bit. It starts to get a little more defined. It sounds a little less nasal. kind of has good quality to it. All these sinuses are actually lined by mucosa, and that's what, well, that is what gets infected. It's this mucosal layer that gets infected, fluid can accumulate in there, and then it can cause significant pain and tenderness. The sinuses actually also all communicate with the nasal cavity through specific meatuses, as we'll discuss in a second. So the first one is you have the maxillary sinus, and this is located deep to the maxillary bone, and it's innervated by the maxillary nerve. This one is very, very, very important because it is at significant risk for infections following dental procedures. As you can imagine, any sort of infection in the maxillary row of teeth, an abscess, an infection, something like that, you pull a tooth, bacteria or normal or flora can then access vascularly easily enough into the maxillary sinus and cause 
maxillary sinusitis, maxillary sinus infection. It's also important to note that in certain injuries or trauma to the eye, the eye can actually compress, it can actually force a significant amount of pressurized force inferiorly through the weaker maxillary wall and actually push the orbital contents into the maxillary sinus and causing things like um, intraocular nerve obstruction, intraocular muscle obstruction, even infraorbital vessels injury. The sensation to the maxillary sinus is provided by the infraorbital, the anterior, the middle, and the posterior superior alveolar nerves. And it also provides, it also has parasympathetic innervation via the facial nerve, which is also called the greater petrosal nerve, which helps with just secretion of the mucus, of the mucosal lining. You have the ethmoid sinus, and the ethmoid sinus is located between the orbit and the nasal cavity. It's often called the ethmoid sinus, ethmoid air cells. This also shares a very weak lateral wall to the orbital, to the orbit, and just as like an orbital blowout fracture can happen when a punch to the eye can blow out, blow out contents of the eye inferiorly, oftentimes it can blow out contents medially as well. There are actually three different areas of the ethmoid air cells called the anterior middle and the posterior groups, and these all share different entranceways into the nasal cavity. Their innervation is provided by the anterior and posterior ethmoidal nerves, and again, their parasympathetic innervation comes off the facial branches of the PT ganglion, as we'll discuss later in a section on the pterygopalatine fossa. Then you have the sphenoid sinus, which is located right next to the pituitary gland, very immediate to that, and actually is uh, used when you try to access surgery, it's important for the pituitary gland, called the transphenoidal process, transphenoidal incision, transphenoidal access. The sphenoidal sinusitis is a potential complication in cavernous sinus infections and thrombosis, and it's important because of their close proximity to the cavernous sinus, which pretty much wraps around the whole sphenoid sinus. This sensation is actually provided by the posterior ethmoidal nerve, and its parasympathetic is again provided by the facial nerve, the PT ganglion. Then you have the frontal sinus, and this is a very unique one that actually drains by gravity, it's the only sinus that drains by gravity. It's located pretty much intimate with behind the eyebrows, and it has two areas called the anterior table and the posterior table. And when you have a fracture of the frontal sinus, it can actually be a very complicated problem because trying to do reconstruction or try to kind of um, fix the displaced fracture of the anterior and posterior table can actually be very difficult. It may actually even require multidisciplinary teams with plastic surgery or neurosurgery to kind of fix these tables. So sensory and parasympathetic to the frontal sinus is provided by the supraorbital nerve. Now we're going to go ahead and discuss some clinical pearls. So we talked about it again many times before, the whole concept of premature closure of these sutures. When that happens, it's called craniosynostosis. And what happens when you have craniosynostosis, a lot of different long-term sequelae can happen. You can have increased intracranial pressure because the brain has nowhere to grow but down. It can cause herniation inferiorly through the frame and magnum. It could also cause obstruction of CSF flow, which can cause hydrocephalus. It can also cause permanent deformation of the skull itself, requiring some sort of plastic reconstructive surgical repair. It just, it's, a, it's a whole host of problems. And anytime you have increased intracranial pressure, you always should do a phonoscopic exam to see if there's optic nerve compression. And again, based on the different types of sutures that are fused, whether it's the metopic suture, the lambdoid, satrochronal, whatever it may be, you will actually get a specific type of craniosynostosis. So one would be like trigonocephaly, in which the brain actually looks like a trigon or, or triangle-like shape. You get a plagiocephaly, which people think of a form of craniosynostosis, but plagiocephaly is more used to like deformation of skull because the child is laying down oftentimes rather than actually being a frank craniosynostosis effect. So as we discussed before, the brain and the skull grow perpendicular to each other. So when you have fusion of the skull, you're going to get them to grow parallel to each other. So as you imagine, if this right here right above here, let's say the sagittal suture right above here, this one is fused, and you're going to get the skull, and you're going to get the brain grow both parallel, and you're going to get nice elongation of the skull, which is very, very, very deformative. So now we're going to discuss the pterion and the asterion. So these are different, different locations in the skull where there's actually fusion of these sutures of these different bones. So the pterion is this anterior located one, more or less anterior and, and lateral, and it is where the middle meningeal artery actually runs in close proximity. When you go and grab a skull in the cadaver lab, or even this image here, you actually see it very well, you can actually see this indentation right here, 
This is the middle meningeal artery actually forming an indentation to the side of the skull because of the high pressure arterial system. Now what happens is it's because of the fusion of all these bones, it's actually a little bit weak right here. And because of the fact that it is, it is actually weak, it actually is, is actually a potential site of displaced fractures, especially things like baseball bats or, or car accidents or punches to the head or hitting the head on concrete. You could fracture this area, causing a displaced fracture. The bone projects inwards, severs the middle meningeal artery, creating a high pressure bleed called an epidural bleed, which is a medical emergency. The other one is called the asterion. The asterion is more like a posterior lateral site of fusion of these bones. It doesn't really carry a significant medical management kind of concept like the middle meningeal terion does, but it does have an important concept because it's in a common site of neurosurgical access as the fusion site of the parietal mastoid sutures. And the way that I remember it, the way that my sister told me, was the terion, which is in the front, just gotta remember it, and then the ass in the back, asterion in the back. So as we discussed again before, when these, future, these sutures, they don't fuse, it can actually be important because you can use this failing of the future, sutures of fusion to actually help with some sort of diagnostic importance. For example, you can either have the fontanelle bulging or you can have the fontanelle kind of sunken. When it's bulging, it can be signs like intracranial pressure from a trauma, encephalitis, it can be from a fall, oftentimes from shaking, shaking baby syndrome, child abuse, or even some sort of tumor, whether extra or intracranial tumors. If it's a sunken anterior fontanelle, the fontanelle, you put your thumb there, you kind of feel it, and it feels a little sunken in, and it's not flush with your surrounding skull, they can indicate most notably something like dehydration or even something like hypothyroidism. So we discussed a little bit before, when we talked about the meningeal artery bleed, that's a terion, you also have a subdural hematoma. So a subdural hematoma, as the word describes, you have a subdural bleed, sub being beneath the dura, so beneath the dura mater between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater and in this space. And it's in this space where you have structures called bridging veins and these bridging veins actually will provide a means of venous drainage for like the skull and anything else uh, to the superior sagittal sinuses which is one of those internal central nervous venous drainage systems. And what happens especially almost all the time it's in a, it's in a clinical situation you have either an elderly individual in a nursing home falls down and then gradual decline or an alcoholic was gradually declining because they have atrophic brains. Their brains have shrunken down, their, their veins have to travel a greater distance, and they're at greater risk of injury. So how do they present? They present with trauma, falls, something like that, and gradual decline. They have the headache, they have the confusion, and the, they have the gradual decline until eventually it's, it's, it's uh, very detrimental. And when you do this, and you have a, when you have an imaging modality done, most notably CT, you're going to see a crescent shape. The way that I kind of think about it, it's very logical, is when you have a very slow bleed, like a like a like a like a venous bleed, you're gonna have slow progression of blood. So it's gonna try to it's gonna try to accumulate everywhere it can first before moving inwards. So it's gonna try to move up, it's gonna try to move down before it actually tries to move inwards. Then you have the epidural bleed, as we discussed before, it accumulates between the dura mater and the skull itself. It's high pressured system, it's a middle meningeal artery. It's often caused by displacing of the terion. How does this present? It presents with trauma, baseball bat, car accident, head in the concrete, displaced fracture. The kid wakes up right away. Oh yeah, it hurt. It wasn't it was it was painful? It wasn't great. They you know they're they're doing fine. They're very lucid. They're not they're doing there's no problems. And then boom, before you know it, rapid decline. They're throwing up, vomiting, lethargic, confused, and eventually they can die. And the difference is is it's because this high pressure system, the way I think about it is it's just bleeding rapidly. There's so much blood that's just accumulating in the space that it's just pushing into the brain itself as quick and as fast as it can, creating up almost like a lens shaped. Like the, like the bleed just wants to get in first. It doesn't take its time to move up. It doesn't take its time to move down. It wants to just high pressure its way right to the middle of the brain. And that concludes the Vinci Academy head and neck chapter on osteology. Thank you very much.